Welcome back, everyone. My name is Arjuri Vasilakis, and I am here with Jessica Stiver, whom you have met on stage already, and Dr. Maisha Cherry, whom you heard us talk so much about. Now you're going to hear from both of them. A little bit about the two of you before we get started in this conversation. First, our guest, Dr. Maisha Cherry, is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. She has colleagues, philosopher colleagues, who are very jealous of her right now, who in essence have said, how did you get acquired to be performing your work? <laughs> so her work, her research work, is about the role of emotions and attitudes in public life. You already know about the book that inspired this concert, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle, but it ends up, surprisingly, being part of a trilogy. One book that's come out now, and you must find it, is on forgiveness. It's called, what is it called? Failures of Forgiveness, What We Get Wrong and How to Do Better. Did you know you were going to write that book? <laughs> and um, maybe we'll talk about your podcast, but I want to hear about the third one before we go to Jessica. It's on love. It's on love. Are you going to give us a little spoiler? <laughs> I'm still figuring it out myself. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, so I'm in, are you still doing monthly podcasts? It's a podcast that's called Unmute, the Unmute podcast. And you describe it by saying it's a philosophical hip hop. And it gives an ear to voices and topics that mainstream philosophy does not give much attention to. Can you give an example, maybe an exemplar, that, gives, that lets us know something about what you care about in that podcast? Well, philosophers have a tendency to be quite interested in very abstract things. And so the podcast is just to let people know in the world that there's a small section of us that's very interested in real world issues and how to think very deeply about those real world issues. So rage, love, forgiveness, how do we get along, how do we care for each other, and also more politically controversial topics. So that's what we, that's what we talk about. That sounds like hip hop. Jessica Stiver, you're entering your third year with Winsong, um, and you're also the director of the Case Western Reserve University Corral, instructor of record, that means something. <laughs> and I'm intrigued to understand that you used to do this work with middle school singers in the Cincinnati area and had a show choir there they must have been the most excited and jazzed bunch of young people. Now you're a doctoral student here at Case Western Reserve in music education. Um, can you tell us what the working title is of your, of your doctorate thesis? That's a good question, Arjuri. <laughs> it changes probably it weekly, sure does. right? Mm. Yeah, essentially um, I want to investigate the motivating factors of older queer adults who participate in queer affinity choirs like Winsong. I'm curious if the unique struggles at that intersection of being a queer older adult, if choir might serve as a coping mechanism, if it might be a social family replacement or just addition, if it might be just, oh, this is something I never have done in my life before and here's a safe bunch of people to do it with. Um, there's been a lot of research on LGBTQ plus choirs in general, and a lot of youth LGBTQ plus singers, but nothing really in that older generation. Um, and Winsong actually inspired that because you all have so many unique stories that I wanted to learn more about. And then dissertation <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, one thing you did recently was for the Sister Singers Network Festival that Winsong hosted 
almost a year ago now, you offered a workshop called Experiences of Gender Nonconforming Singers. It feels to me like that's going to be a chapter. And you said it, Jessica, this is about stories. So we've created this story in this concert, this interweaving inspired by A Case for Rage. And I'm just curious about how you both first came to know each other. And you've become collaborators now of a sort. So Jessica, since you're talking, tell us your story first. Will do. So the idea for this concert actually started about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, I was taking a philosophy of music education course at Case taught by Dr. Lisa Copes, and she encouraged her students to read a variety of philosophy books of our choice, um, some with music ed, some just philosophy in general in other areas, and I came across The Case for Rage with one of my colleagues, and it just struck me in such a way. Um, I've always been kind of a little rageful in general, but also very, very concerned about issues of social justice without a lot of direction. So in this class, Dr. Copes said that for our midterm, we could do any kind of creative assignment, anything that's not write a paper, give a PowerPoint presentation. And I thought, oh, we see a lot of really good music with messages. There's a lot of choir music that has messages of rage in it. And I was like, ooh, a case for rage, a concert for rage. That would be a fun project to do. And so I made like a YouTube playlist and made fake programs and like wrote program notes that like have kind of made their way into this at times. And you know, that was the project. I played the playlist for the class, passed around the fake programs, got an A. And <laughs> About six months later, I got COVID, and in what I can only describe as a fever dream, I thought, oh, I, ha I conduct choirs. That's my job now. We could do this for real. And when I sent the email initially to your, representative, uh, your representation, I was like very sick, sweating, like, can Maisha Cherry come to Cleveland? We're gonna do a concert for Rage. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know any of this was happening. Um, I'm glad I can be part of this 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 story. But um, I mean, th it's stuff like this that really makes me makes me happy. I mean, I'm gonna ask you later on, like, how did you really come across the book? Like, did you Google it? Did someone? Because that's just fascinating to me as a as an author. But this is probably one of the greatest stories that an author can hear. Um, not only that someone finds your book that's not a philosopher, um, but finds it generative, um, but also more importantly, finds it inspirational. And I love art, I love music, um, I consider myself a cultural human being, and those worlds don't typically match up in my world, in my academic world. Um, and so as soon as I got the email, I was very excited. My, my literary agent sent me an email and she said, because she hadn't known about what was happening behind the scenes, and she was like, did you know that somebody's gonna do a concert on your book? That's freaking amazing. I was like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I'm just happy, I'm happy to be here, happy to be a part of this wonderful occasion, and I'm getting so much from being here, so I'm just, I'm just grateful. Also, sorry, the book, I thought, came across the book uh, because Dr. Copes, the professor, she had a giant spreadsheet of different options and different focuses and anti-racism and rage. I was like, oh, that. <laughs> of course. Um, so the, the concert so far, we're halfway through, the concert is following a trajectory of ways of thinking about anger. And you introduce us to anger, to rage that is productive, and you give it a name. Could you tell us a little bit about how to contrast this rage that you're talking about, why you call it what you call it, with what we think about that we need to tamp down? Yes. So I call it, it's an anti-racist anger. It's a productive, appropriate anti-racist anger. Um, but more specifically, I call it Lordian rage, um, because I came to anger as a topic by reading the work of Audre Lorde. 
and I read her essay, Uses of Anger, um, and it was better from any philosophy paper on anger that I've ever, ever read. Um, and so a lot of what I think about anger is inspired from her or by her. And the book is just more of kind of an inspiration. I mean, that's a kind of a theme here is thinking about her ideas and just building on, on top of it. And so Lordian rage is a, is a rage that's productive. It's a rage that's appropriate. Um, it's a rage um, that a lot of people are afraid of, but not for the reasons that they typically say that they are afraid of it. Um, because it brings about a kind of radical transformation. It's a rage that shows the value or displays the value of marginalized lives. Um, it's a rage that's destructive uh, to uh, races. We can even, even say homophobic or all the isms that seek to keep us bound. Um, and it's very different from anger that tends to go wrong. So it's very different, if I can be a little bit more explanatory, it's very different from January 6th anger. Um, perhaps is also different from the last argument that you had. <laughs> um, and I want to say that now ang all anger is the same. Um, it looks different in different contexts. Um, and so we need to be very careful with pain and anger in broad strokes, just thinking just because you're angry, then you ought not to be, or just because you're angry, then you're going to be violent. I want to say, no, let's not get rid of it. It has a role to play. And Audre Lorde helps us think through those things. She helps us think through a lot of things. Yes. Um, I'd like to hear from both of you about the role of the arts in um, bringing awareness to Lordian rage and expressing it. So I think as a singer choir director, when I first read the anchor management part of your book, realizing that, oh, there are places to address, to channel this rage, um, and one of them was through artistic expression. and. That's, that's the thing that I know how to do. Sometimes it's either, if there's no answer out there, so many things, so many writings, we were talking earlier about, there's so many things that are suggest like this is wrong, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. And there's no solution, there's no what's next. Um, and even when some of those what's next do you know, come into light, Sometimes I feel like, okay, I will, you know, I'll go to marches, I'll donate where I can, when I'm able to. But using, and it's not just with vocal music, but if anybody has any kind of artistic superpower, that can be, I found so powerful. I mean, one of my favorite things about choral music and art in general is that idea of storytelling. You know, storytelling can promote empathy. If you're able to, we talked about this at our last concert, um, if you are able to, as students, as singers, as instrumentalists, as artists, if you're able to really take the time to delve deep into what you are presenting and understand its message and really be able to convey the message to the audience, whether it's with, you know, again, I used to have a show choir, so all about the facials, um, you know, but actually showing and having that come from a really true, authentic place um, has been shown to encourage empathy amongst audiences. And with that empathy, though, what next? Because, yeah, you can sympathize, you can empathize. Um, one of the reasons why in the programs there's the QR code for resources. Um, I'm hoping that after all this, you know, when the concert ends, the stuff we're singing about doesn't stop. So art can be used as a starting point to engage people with empathy, to make each other want to do more, hopefully, and then provide steps to go from there. So I do sincerely hope that you all will check out those resources, some good local, um, local places in Cleveland. Uh, for example, actually right now, the 50-50 raffle that is happening is gonna benefit the Urban League of Greater Cleveland. So a good local organization that helps promote equity here in our city. So, yeah, <laughs> any way that you can use art to bring attention to that I think is helpful. Yeah, you, you made me think about, when I think about particularly African-American tradition of music, I think about some of the most memorable pieces of music was created out of anger. So you go back to Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. The beauty in that, but also the fire and the fury 
and that, which talks about lynching and the experience of lynching. And then, you know, I'm a, you know, I was born in the late 70s, early 80s, without giving you the exact time in which I was born, so you cannot calculate. Um, but hip hop, back in the day, hip hop was, was angry. It was, it was what we call kind of conscious hip hop. And within that kind of angry hip hop was also, when you listen to it, you learned a lot. I mean, I must say the first African American studies class that I took was just listening to angry hip hop music. And so that just goes to show that not only can anger kind of inspire us to create these particular art forms, but through those particular art forms, we're able to discover, we're able to be challenged to change our ways, we're able to learn things that we didn't learn, learn before. So the artist is having kind of a creative outlet, right? They're, they're being able to express it. But we as an audience can benefit from that, whether that's by learning more, whether that's being challenged more, and that's just what I love about just the intersection of just art and emotions that has the power to do those things. You make a point in the book about even people who are using Lordy and Rage may misuse it, and allies who are doing our best. Why you suggest using the word co-conspirator. Can you say something about the traps that, that performers or anyone could, could fall into um, in, their, in their allyship? You know, one of the things that I say just as an ethicist in general is that I just don't think there's perfect human beings. Um, and there is always room to grow, just as there's room to mess up. And what I try to do in, in my work is to just make sure that we're getting better, we're getting better. But the only way that we can get better is be aware of ways in which we, we mess up. And so even when we have good intentions, um, when we decide that we're going to um, be a part of a movement, or be in solidarity with other people, that does not necessarily mean that we can no longer kind of reinforce the same kind of supremacy or mistakes um, or oppression that we're trying to fight against. And try, I just try to ward us off of that or expose us to some of those mistakes that, that, that we can make. Um, but I also wanna say that it's not just co-conspirators that can do that, just us in general. No matter what we can, even with this appropriate angle, we could go wrong. And so I'm providing insight on how to stay on the, the right path um, with that. I mean, one of the ways to be a little bit more specific is that thinking that uh, the way that we feel about someone else's oppression, it feels so bad, I feel so bad, I feel so angry. And we have a tendency to think that we, that feeling is the same feeling that a marginalized person have. And so therefore, I know how they feel, even to the point that we might even think that we feel worse than them. Right? So those are just some of the mistakes that we can make and kind of what that stems from and, and what that communicates to someone that we're in solidarity with. And so in the book, um, hopefully you all pick it up to this wonderful independent bookstore that would love your support at the end of this Logan concert. Berry Books. Um, kind of lays out in more detail what those m mistakes are and how we can, how we can do better with them. Hmm. I know that you have marked some pages in the book that you'd like to share with us. Do you just want to riff with those? Let's do it. Okay. okay. All right. So since we talked about Audre Lorde a little bit, I'm going to start off with talking about her just a little bit. On April 28th, 1973, a 10-year-old black boy, Clifford Glover, was shot and killed by a white New York City police officer. The officer was indicted for his murder, but eventually acquitted of charges by a jury of his peers. 11 of the 12 were white men. Audre Lorde heard the verdict on the radio while driving from the airport. Quote, sickened with fury, blinded by rage, writes her biographer. She pulled her car over. On the side of the road, she wrote a poem entitled Power. She says, I am trapped on a desert of raw gunshot wounds and a dead child dragging his shattered black face off the edge of my sleep. Blood punctured from his cheeks and shoulders is the only liquid for miles. She continues, a policeman who shot down a 10 year old in queen stood over the boy with his cop shoes and chider's blood. This policeman said in his own defense, I didn't notice the size, no nothing else, only the color. Reflecting on her own agency and the future, she writes, I have not been able to touch the destruction within me, but unless I learn to use the difference between poetry and rhetoric, my power too will run corrupt as poisonous mold or lie limp and useless as an unconnected wire. 
It's in this moment that Audre Lorde is faced with the reality of black death at the hands of the police, as well as the justice system's shameful and inadequate response to it. Nevertheless, she's trying to figure out how to use her own power and anger, not to destroy or to corrupt, but to wield it in useful ways. She is also reminding us of the power we all possess. In order to make use of this power, there are some things that we must learn first. So one thing I know for sure is that if anti-racist anger is in response to racism, and racism is resilient, then the rage must be just as resilient as the racism to combat it. The way that anger remains resilient is by playing the role that I have described. Here's a recap or a preview for a lot of you of the role of anger in anti-racist struggle. It communicates the value of lives, particularly the racially marginalized and the oppressed. It alarms us to racism and racial injustice in explicit and subtle forms. It advertises racial justice worth. It makes us believe that we can change things. It makes us want to take risks to impact the future. It makes us optimistic that we can make a less racist and more just world possible. It motivates us to engage in productive action to end racial injustice. It allows us to resist racial rules that says that only whites have a right to assert their value and receive respect. It allows us to resist racial rules that declares that whiteness and white supremacy should be the norm. It turns allies into rage renegades. Like a coachable superstar athlete, anti-racist anger can be managed and cultivated to perform these functions at the highest level. So here are some things that I suggest to prevent a person's power through their rage from becoming corrupt. Get in solidarity with others. Express the anger. Create goals and plans to achieve racial justice. Resist those who try to silence and dismiss appropriate anti-racist anger. Be careful not to use anger to engage in the same supremacy that you are fighting against. You don't need to cool it first in order to engage in anti-racist struggle. Because anti-racist anger, what I have referred to Lordy and Rage, is aimed at radical change, has an inclusive perspective, motivates productive action, and is also compatible with and complementary to care, compassion, empathy, and love, those who are angry need to become more respectable or palatable to others in order to engage productively in the struggle. They, we, already have what we need to use. And that is what you call anger management. <laughs> we could write a few, rewrite a few psychological treatises. Wow. Your practicality is something that you told us earlier, is something that many philosophers don't do. That's for others to do. Where did that come from for you, your need to be practical that way? Yeah, so in, at, at breakfast this morning, um, one of the choir members were expressing the fact that they really appreciated at the end of the book that I give kind of practical advice or a, advice that you can apply to your life. And it's usually the case um, in philosophy, we don't do that. <laughs> um, we like to tell people how to think about things um, so that they can do whatever they want to do. Um, and we like to theorize, but the practical stuff, we kind of leave that to the clinical psychologists or the self-help books. I read a lot of clinical psychology and self-help books, and so this was right up my alley. Um, and I also just felt that if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm writing a book about something that is not just theoretical out there in the, out there in the heavenly realms, as Plato would say it, um, but it's about what's happening in the real world, then I couldn't just theorize. I had to offer kind of practical steps about what we need to do. I mean, one of the things that I say in the book is that, yes, I've written this book for us to kind of rethink anger, theoretical. But I also want this to be a kind of a manual um, to those who are trying to fight against anti-racist struggle. It's a manual for activists. 
And so in order to do that, if it's going to be a manual, then I need to kind of put myself out there and say, hey, these are some things that I suggest. Try them in your own particular way, but I don't want to hold back on that. And I think my commitment to that kind of instructive part or suggestive part has a lot to do with the fact of how I was raised. My mother was physically handicapped all her life, was committed to a variety of issues. She was a community organizer, um, always volunteering. There were no academics. There are no academics in my family. I'm the only person in my family who has a PhD. Um, so to kind of be true to the core of how I was raised and the audience and the connection that I still have with that community, um, it requires for me not to just get to them or to think with them, but to kind of offer some steps to how we can, we can put this stuff out in the real world to kind of change the world. Um, yeah, so you have just read to us, said to us that we may wield our anger in useful ways. Now you've suggested that we can read the manual, which is possible because Logan Berry Books is here. Yes, right out there to the... I know that you bookmarked a couple of other passages. Is there something else you want to leave us with? Oh, you're putting me on the spot here. Put me on the spot. If, if this was like a cafe, I'll ask, are there any requests um, from the people who read the book? Um, I guess what I'll do, this is really on the spot here. Um, You look like you're thinking. Do yeah, I thinking. want to read this or not? That means I, I dropped <laughs> the mic. Nothing. I, no, there's nothing. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I, so, I so encourage reading this book. People have said again and again, and you're probably sick of hearing, just what how... did they say? Tell me. It's so readable. Oh, they said that. It's Wonderful. so practical. It's so true. Now, we had a um, book club, as you know, that has been looking at this book for the last six weeks. And uh, if anybody wants to shout out from that book club, one more way to finish that sentence. This book is so, please do so. This book is so. They forgot. It's trans, it's trans. Relevant. Relevant, Relevant. yeah. Thought provoking. Life changing, -changing. yeah. Dynamic. You betcha. It's very important. Thank you for being our Thank very you for important Thank you. guest. Maisha Cherry. Stick around for the second half of our concert. <laughs>